All right. Um, um, we're just really happy to have Emmy, Emily Vale here. She's the executive director of uh, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. Uh, I'll tell you a few things or a quick um, introduction. Um, all living things depend on the quality of the watershed's ecosystems. If the watersheds are healthy, they filter out all the toxic chemicals from roofs, and parking lots, and roads and gas stations. Um, the effects of agriculture, industry, um, et cetera. And um, if they're not healthy, they take less, well, they, they do less. Um, but uh, thankfully, uh, there are people like Emily who dedicate their lives, so, or at least their careers, to let people know about how important watersheds are. Emily served for eight years as the watershed outreach specialist for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Hudson River Estuary Program in collaboration with New York State Water Resources Institute at Cornell University. Her support has, her work has supported community-based watershed groups, municipalities, and other partners throughout the region to improve water quality in the Hudson Valley. The research is focused on green infrastructure performance, urban streams, and intersections of art and community engagement. So welcome, Emily. Thank you for coming by and showing us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here with you all uh, in this virtual space. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, show you my PowerPoint here. Um, and it's going to be challenging for me to um, get my screen here um, to see any comments that come in in the chat. But if anyone has any really burning questions or really wants clarifications, please go ahead and, and put those, those comments or questions in the chat. Uh, and John will stop me and flag me down if I need to um, answer any questions. But otherwise, we'll do questions at the end. So. Um, Again, my name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, and I'm going to be presenting today on work on watersheds. So I'll talk a little bit about why we're so interested in watersheds. John already gave a great introduction, but we'll talk more about it. I'll talk a little bit about the Hudson River Watershed Alliance and the work that we do, watershed groups uh, and who they are. And then I'll share some stories and findings from our work on watersheds project and needs assessment project, along with what's next and uh, how you can stay involved. So uh, go ahead and mute yourselves if you're not already. And if you'd like to turn off your, your screen, you know, feel free. Um, and then we'll come back together after the presentation is over. So first, we're going to talk about why watersheds, why we're so interested in them and what makes them so valuable and important. So a watershed is the land area where water flows to a specific water body. And the water that falls from the sky as precipitation, rain, or snow will hit the ground surface and run downhill towards a particular body of water. And this, this is really shown well in this graphic here, where we see the high points represent the watershed divide. So if the rain falls on this one side, uh, you know, it'll go in this direction. If it falls on the other side, it'll go into a different watershed. And then, you know, we have the water coming in from the rain, from streams, and then also from groundwater. So when I used to describe what a watershed is, I used to say it's the land area that flows to a particular body of water. And I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, land doesn't really flow. That's not really a, a good way to describe it. But in fact, you know, underneath the ground surface, there is groundwater that just like the surface water is flowing in a particular direction to feed our water bodies so that even during droughts, even during dry periods, those water bodies are still flowing. So typically we have these watershed areas that are defined by topography, defined by the lay of the land that includes surface water and groundwater all flowing to a common water body. We have tributaries, which are smaller streams that flow into a larger river. Um, and this whole area, like I said, is, is defined by topography most of the time. 
So the Hudson River watershed is 13,400 square miles. Uh, it includes the Upper Hudson, the Mohawk River, and the Hudson River estuary watershed. I'm so sorry about my cat. This is going to be how it is. Um, so this map here shows uh, the Upper Hudson in yellow, the Mohawk River watershed in blue, and the Hudson River estuary in purple. And you see all of these small streams that are part of these larger watersheds. So we know that tributaries support the health and the ecosystem of the Hudson River. And so because we're interested in the Hudson River, we're interested in the whole watershed system, looking at that whole ecosystem and how it all comes together. And each tributary has its own watershed. So we've got these three major watersheds that we can divide the Hudson River watershed into. And we can divide that further down and further down into each one of these small streams. And so to show that, we've got this map here, um, which shows some of the, the larger watersheds uh, in the Hudson River watershed. Of course, right here, we've got the Rondout Creek watershed, uh, which is the watershed of the town of Rochester. And if we zoom into this area, you can see it's, it's where it's located within the larger context. We can look at the Rondout Creek watershed itself. Uh, this great map was was made by uh, Laura Heady from the DEC at Hudson River Estuary Program and Cornell University. So here we can start to see the, you know, the Rondout Creek flowing towards Kingston and a number of the tributaries here. And we can zoom in a little further if we're interested in say, the Rochester Creek watershed and look at that watershed as well. So we can look at watersheds across a variety of scales, um, looking at a scale that's appropriate for what we're interested in. And we know, again, because the Hudson River watershed is so large, go back to that map, because it is so large, we really need to work at the local level and take out these smaller pieces, work together on our smaller watersheds so that we can come together for a more healthy Hudson River ecosystem. Okay, so watersheds then are a geographic unit that we can use to understand conditions on the land that impact the water and understand how we can better manage water bodies. Because they're based on topography, watersheds rarely align with municipal boundaries. They're a different unit that uh, does not follow our political boundaries, right? So this map is from the Tidal Rondout Creek Watershed Management Plan. It shows the Tidal Rondout portion in red. And of course, the whole rest of the Rondout Creek also flows to this area, but here they're just looking at the water that flows directly to the tidal portion. And we can see that it does not follow municipal boundaries, right? Those are our black lines here. But we can look at a map like this and start to get a better understanding of what conditions are like in the watershed from a bird's eye view and start to understand what kinds of impacts we might expect. For example, these red areas here show higher levels of development um, from Kingston, where I live. And so we might expect there to be impacts from impervious surfaces like parking lots and driveways. We have these purple areas that are quarries. We have these green areas that are forested, but some steep slopes. And so we can look at these maps, including these watershed boundaries, and start to get a sense of how land use and various activities within the watershed will impact the waters downstream. Sometimes the reverse is true, right? Sometimes there might be problems with water quality or flooding that are localized. And then we look upstream into the watershed for solutions. A good example of that is the Riverkeeper project, uh, which has been collecting citizen science data from the Rondell Creek and a number of other Hudson River tributaries um, where there might be a water quality issue. And then we're looking up into the watershed to try to understand what might be causing some of those problems. The land directly alongside rivers and streams is also really important. The riparian areas, the floodplains play a really important role in water quality, in stream health. But we also need to look at the whole watershed system because all of that water is connected both through surface water and groundwater. So 
all of the land surface on earth is in some watershed. Everyone lives, works, plays in a watershed, and there's a role for each person to play. Watershed groups in particular coordinate work on watersheds in a variety of ways and help keep a lot of this watershed scale work moving forward, um, particularly because it can be challenging uh, given that watersheds don't follow those political boundaries, they don't follow the jurisdictions that some other groups may be looking at. And I think I'll close this section with a quote from Luna Leopold, a real preeminent uh, USGS hydrologist and son of Aldo Leopold, who said that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And I think that really sums this up. We can't have clean water without a healthy watershed. And so the land and water are really interconnected and it's important to use that watershed scale, to use the understanding of watershed conditions to figure out which actions to take place to protect and manage our streams and rivers. Uh, this is a picture of members of the Roundout Creek Watershed Alliance doing a tree maintenance event this summer with some great social distance. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Hudson River, Hudson River Watershed Alliance and who we are. So the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is a regional nonprofit that began in 2005 and was incorporated in 2010 as its own nonprofit. We work across the Hudson River watershed to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. So this is a picture of our board and staff. Uh, I'm the executive director and the only staff person, but we have a really active and engaged working board. So we have lots of great partnerships. The Hudson River Watershed Alliance works to support local watershed groups, improve intermunicipal coordination on water issues, and communicate as a collective voice on watershed issues across the Hudson Valley region. We host a variety of education capacity building programs like workshops, a monthly breakfast lecture series that I know some of you have attended, our annual watershed conference, and roundtables to bring watershed group leaders together to talk about their interests and share strategies so that we can learn from each other. Before COVID-19 hit, we held a lot of meetings that looked like this photo um, where we had people in, in the room for an all day meeting focused on particular topics, sharing information. And these days it looks a lot more like this, which is probably a pr pretty familiar site. Um, but I'm happy to say that even during COVID, we continue to offer these programs online and, and hopefully making them more accessible to more of the people throughout our region. In terms of a couple of the, the programs that we do with municipalities, we've partnered with the Nature Conservancy to offer community resilience building workshops to help groups of municipalities look at flood risk and identify actions related to climate change adaptation. And we've also partnered with Pace University Land Use Law Center to bring a land use training to communities that are interested in watershed issues. So now I'll talk a little bit about watershed groups. Who are these watershed groups that we're working so hard to support? So when I talk about watershed groups, I'm talking about community-based initiatives that are working specifically on watershed issues in the Hudson Valley. Many of these groups are volunteer run. We have a couple that are intermunicipal councils where municipalities have entered into an intermunicipal agreement on a watershed scale. We have some that are led by agencies or nonprofits or watershed groups that are, have staff support from agencies or nonprofits. And I think what really sets watershed groups apart is their local knowledge of their watershed and the ways that they're advocating for its health. Again, this is a scale that others um, it, it might not quite fall within their purview. And so watershed groups play a really important role being the, the boots in the ground, the waders in the water, and really understanding and communicating these local conditions. And we found that collaboration is really key, that these watershed groups are certainly not working in a silo. These, these are really holistic issues. Working from a watershed scale, it requires understanding how all of these different pieces fit together. And so collaboration has been really key to the success of these groups. So the kinds of things that watershed groups do include convening stakeholders, coordinating projects, educating residents, promoting stewardship, 
monitoring water quality. This is a photo of members of the Rojan watershed community taking samples this summer. They partner on research projects and they also create watershed plans to identify issues and actions to protect watersheds. Again, overall, these groups are taking a watershed approach. They're looking at these problems holistically. They're looking at issues in the water, on the landscape, and they're working at the local level in partnership with other groups across the Hudson River watershed. Each stream that flows to the Hudson is connected to its health. And so each of these small community watershed groups operates as part of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance to improve clean water throughout the region. Um, I think this photo was taken at a town of Rochester ECC uh, event, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, we, we know that environmental conservation commissions play a really important role in partnership with watershed groups as well. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, photo by Laura Heedy. So next, I'm going to talk. That, that was our um, one of our first Rondell Creek Watershed Alliance events that we did with Bull Warsing, Rosendale, Marbletown, and Rochester. And that was Ben uh, Gannon doing a wave training for that event. Great. Thank you, Laura, for setting the story straight for me. I knew I knew that someone would have the answer there. Okay, great. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about work on watersheds, which is our brand new report that was just published in 2020. I've got a, my copy right here, uh, always on my desk for reference. Um, but a PDF copy is also available on our website. And when I'm done with sharing my screen, I'll put a, a number of links into the chat for some of the things that I'm talking about, including the PDF of work on watersheds. And this report is the first of its kind. It compiles success stories from 32 different watershed groups that are working on Hudson River tri tributaries and tells a story about each one and some of the impacts that they've had. Watershed groups are working on diverse issues, water quality, flooding, stream habitat, drinking water source protection, climate resiliency, education, community engagement, and more. Uh, this is the back cover of our report. And I have this in particular to remind myself to give uh, a thank you to the Hudson River Estuary Program and Nui Pick for sponsoring this important project. So here are a couple of the spreads just to get a sense of what this report is like. Um, we've got each tributary has its own section. Each watershed group has its own story with photos and highlights. Here's a couple more examples. And of course, I had to share the Rondell Creek Watershed Alliance, uh, which has a really nice centerfold spread, actually, right, right in the middle of the report. And we'll talk more about this uh, project in a second. In addition to the work on watersheds report, one of the projects that the Hudson River Watershed Alliance has been working on is a needs assessment of watershed groups across the region. So in 2019 and 2020, we interviewed watershed groups to learn more about their strengths and needs. And through that process, we identified specific themes that show where watershed groups have strengths that have led to great successes, but also where some groups might have weaknesses. And one of the advantages of working as an alliance and working together is that we can learn from each other and learn from what uh, certain experiences have been to share what strengths groups have, share their experiences and bring those to help their peers. There's a really important relationship between local and regional work. We know that implementation takes place at the local level. New York State is a home rule state. So even if we're looking at the watershed, we're looking at the water that's upstream or downstream, you know, each municipality has the power to control land use within their own municipal boundary. So we need to be working together, understanding some of the constraints. Um, this photo is showing um, the city of Newburgh's drinking water supply. They're looking at a map and showing where that water supply is not within the city of Newburgh, where they have really limited ability to um, control land use that has um, had impacts on their drinking water supply. So again, understanding the strengths to build meaningful partnerships based on shared goals. We can learn from our peers and success stories from watershed groups show some of the opportunities that are out there. So I'll be highlighting a series of stories 
based on our needs assessment themes and some of the factors that we've seen really help groups be successful. So those include structure, partnerships with technical experts, and collaborating on implementing projects. So I won't be going through all of the, the stories in the needs assess in the work on watersheds report. I encourage you to take a look at that report, um, but I'll be hitting some of the highlights based on our needs assessment findings. So in terms of structure, uh, it's really helpful for groups to be able to plug into statewide or regional initiatives where they don't have to develop the entire program themselves. There are lots of opportunities to take advantage of regional or statewide projects um, to, to cover more ground, right? To get further with the volunteer time and capacity. So a great example of that is Trees for Tribs, which the Rhonda Oak Creek Watershed Alliance has taken advantage of. This photo is from a particular site on the Coxing Kill, which is a tributary to the Rhonda Oak Creek. And I'm going to ask a trivia question now. Um, my understanding is that the winner will get a tote bag from the ECC. So again, please correct me if, <laughs> if I'm wrong. Um, but there have been 28 plantings in the Roundout Creek watershed at 13 different sites, but this site in particular has had a lot of trees and shrubs planted and wondering if anyone can guess how many trees and shrubs have been planted at this particular site along the Coxing Kill to improve the vegetated buffer along the stream. So I don't know if you want to type it in the chat if you have a guess on the number of trees. pause. Anyone wants to get this tote bag? It costs nothing to try. I'm just going to break in for a second here and show you. I pause. Just to share the screen. All right. Should I stop my screens here? Here we go. No. Oh, here we go. This is our interactive moment. It's the commercial time. This is, yeah. the, <laughs> this is the amazing tote bag. You get if you get the answer to that. If you, nobody gets that answer, we'll have another one ready for you. Well, we knew we knew somebody was going to know the answer, and that person has has proved us right that she does in fact know all about the Rondout Creek watershed. And so that that's Laura, that's Laura Finestone. Oh, she got the answer correct. Oh, she was right on. 600. Wow. Uh, since 2012, the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance has planted 600 trees along the Coxing Kill. That's really significant. And I think that that speaks to the way that a volunteer watershed group can plug right into a state program and take advantage of that. So the Trees for Trips program provides free native trees and shrubs to plant alongside streams. We know that a healthy stream buffer helps filter pollutants, helps manage floods, and so on. So, um, you know, cheers to the Roundout Creek Watershed Alliance. I also, there's a nice series of pictures in the work on watersheds report before, during, and after that really shows that impact um, that you all have had. So, uh, I'm going to keep moving along here. Um, so in terms of other statewide or regional initiatives, the Hudson River Eel Project is an initiative of the Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve and the Hudson River Estuary Program, where volunteers collect baby glass eels that are swimming up Hudson River tributaries every spring. And the Quasea Creek Watershed Alliance is one of the groups that's gotten involved um, in the Quasea Creek in Newburgh. They help coordinate volunteers. And since 2012, over 187,000 glass eels have been caught, counted, and released upstream of the first barrier, um, which is a dam actually, in the Quasayet Creek. So these volunteers are having a direct impact on fish and you know, counting them, understanding their, their numbers, but also helping them get a leg up on the next part of their journey upstream. Other aspects of structure guidance documents that are available. A great example of this is the watershed planning guidance that's available through the New York State Department of State. The Upper Hudson River Watershed Coalition took advantage of a New York State Department of State grant to do a watershed plan across their large area. 
and they followed this New York State Department of State guidance and created a really fantastic plan. So the uh, Upper Hudson River Watershed Coalition is a group of soil and water conservation districts that's coordinated by the Lake Champlain Lake George Regional Planning Board. Um, they've worked uh, to identify 190 different priority projects to achieve their watershed goals, really lining up actions based on current issues and water quality understanding. So another great example of structure. Also got groups working on drinking water. This is the Sawkill Hill watershed community. They used Riverkeeper's drinking water scorecard to understand potential risks to their drinking water supplies, which includes the Sawkill Hill Creek in Red Hook as the drinking water source for Bard College, along with the aquifer that's alongside the Sawkill, Hill, which is the, the Red Hook water supply. So the Sawkill Hill watershed community is working directly with the town of Red Hook to implement watershed protection policies that came out of their scorecard. Moving on to partnerships with technical experts, we asked watershed groups, do you feel like you or your group is lacking technical skills? And we were shocked that almost a third of people said no. We thought everyone would need technical expertise of some kind, but about a third said no um, pretty strongly. And they said, we don't lack technical skills because we have access to people who are experts in a variety of different fields. So through partnerships, they have access to people with knowledge of engineering, water quality monitoring, and so on. Lots of different technical skills. Um, this picture shows a Siena College student doing some water quality monitoring in the Patroon Creek in Albany. The Spark Hill Creek Watershed Alliance is a great example of a group that has really taken advantage of partnerships with technical experts. So they started with um, water quality monitoring through Riverkeeper, their Enterococcus Citizen Science Program, but they've expanded that out now to include new partnerships with researchers at colleges and universities, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. They've joined forces with other watershed groups to form the Lower Hudson Partnership, again, to share information, to share resources, methods, protocols. They've worked with the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Estuary Program, US EPA, and this summer partnered with Riverkeeper and the New York State DEC for a project through the Peers Program, which is a relatively new project to help groups take citizen science samples for nutrients. The Wallkill River Watershed Alliance has also had some really valuable partnerships. In 2016, there was an har extensive harmful algal bloom that looked like this in, in New Paltz. It lasted for over 30 days. It covered over 30 miles of river. And the Wallkill River Watershed Alliance was able to work with scientists that are members of the Wallkill River Watershed Alliance. They happen to have three PhD research scientists who are experts in harmful algal blooms and nutrients um, as part of their, as members of their watershed group. And so they were able to document that harmful algal bloom. They worked with DEC and researchers to make sure that we had uh, confirmation that it was a harmful algal bloom. They confirmed that toxins were extremely high and the Wellco River Watershed Alliance was able to get the word out to the community about the risks and about what a harmful algal bloom is to make sure people and pets avoid the water. The Wellco River Watershed Alliance didn't turn their back on the river though. They wanted to make sure people really understood that the Wellco was a resource, not only a risk. And so Martha Chio and others, um, um, created the Great Wallkill River Race, a paddle, and uh, they also worked to establish the Wallkill River Water Trail with Orange County and the Hudson River Valley Greenway, which now has its own website with all the different access points to paddle the Wallkill and uh, with current conditions on flow and so on. So uh, communicating effectively that this is both, um, you know, has, has risks involved, but is also a tremendous resource to these communities. Volunteer groups, uh, what we found in the needs assessment is that the volunteer groups are not necessarily the ones who are implementing projects. And so that really requires a collaboration to get projects in the ground. So volunteer groups do a great job with watershed planning to line up priority projects, 
to do education on opportunities, the types of things that would help watersheds and also build support for those projects. And we found that municipalities, soil and water conservation districts, and similar partners are really active in implementing projects. We heard in our needs assessment a lot about the need for infrastructure improvements in particular. In terms of flood resilience, the Moodna Creek Watershed Intermunicipal Council has worked really hard um, to plan for flooding and also get the municipalities additional information. So this is a photo um, after Hurricane Irene in the village of Washingtonville, which has sustained tremendous flooding. The Moodna Creek Watershed Intermunicipal Council has been a part of two flood mitigation plans, one for the upper watershed and one for the lower watershed. And they've worked with Orange County Emergency Management to implement stream gauges to monitor flood conditions in real time, including one in the village of Washingtonville that is directly linked to the management system so that if floods are approaching a certain level, they alert the right people to make sure that the appropriate actions are taken. I wanted to quickly mention um, also natural resource inventories and open space plans as an opportunity. This is a project called Tracing the Tannery Brook, which is actually a project of, of mine. <laughs> this is my watershed initiative in Kingston. Um, in 2018, I did a series of art programs, including a gallery exhibit and this interactive installation that was part of Kingston's O Positive Festival on the Tannery Brook, which is a small stream that's largely buried through Kingston. It actually flows in part to the Rondout Creek and in part to the Sopus Creek. It's highly engineered, one of those watershed, um, confusing watersheds that doesn't follow topography. Um, but we had this installation and I asked people who came to it, what belongs in a healthy stream? And so participants drew fish and flowers, they drew trees and rocks, people. Here, I don't know if you could quite make it out. This is a mayfly. So somebody knew that a mayfly belongs in a healthy stream. And it really created a strong vision of what an urban stream could look like and, and what could be there. And so this was an important community engagement process that was happening at the same time that the city of Kingston was working on the natural resource inventory and their open space plan. And so as part of this, it really showed that not only does Kingston care about the big water bodies, the Osopus Creek, the Rondell Creek, the Hudson River, but these small streams in Kingston really matter too. And as part of their open space plan, they adopted the goal of restoring 2,500 linear feet of stream corridors within the city, which is really exciting to have these small streams formally acknowledged in the open space plan, which has now been adopted as part of the comprehensive plan. A couple more examples of collaboration. Um, in the Sawkill Creek watershed in the Woodstock area, Ulster County Department of the Environment was able to undertake watershed scale assessments of culverts. Um, so culverts are places where roads and streams, roads cross over streams, and we want to make sure that culverts are the right size, shape, configuration to make sure that fish can swim upstream and downstream, but also that to make sure that they're not hazards for flooding, that they could be too small, they could be shaped or configured in a way that contributes to flooding, which has been a problem in the Sawkill Creek watershed. So again, collaborating with a municipality at this time at the county level, they were able to undertake this watershed scale assessment, which helps the municipalities move closer to implementation, sets them up well for grant funds to do those culvert replacements. And one last example of collaboration is on green infrastructure for stormwater management in the Monhagen Brook. The Monhagen Brook is a tributary to the Wallkill River in the city of Middletown in Orange County. And in 2016, Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District got a DEC Water Quality Improvement Program grant to do a series of green infrastructure projects at a retail plaza. And here's a stream bank stabilization, which was one of their projects. So not only did those projects serve as a pilot and helped these groups and the municipality see what green infrastructure looks like, how it might be implemented, um, the Soil and Water Conservation District also undertook a watershed plan for the Monhagen Brook and identified opportunities for additional sites of green infrastructure. Even though applications to, to 
further rounds of water quality improvement program were not successful, the city of Middletown realized that these green infrastructure projects were important enough that they were able to find the budget and, and pay for them themselves. So we've got a series of green infrastructure retrofits going into Middletown's downtown area. And I think that speaks to the role that a watershed group can play in piloting some of these projects and collaborating with the Soil and Water Conservation District, and then helping to work with the municipality to educate them and to build support for the kinds of projects that the watershed needs. So that's a lot of, a lot of stories that I just went through. What's next? Again, really encourage you to read and share the work on Watershed's report, really just uh, dipped a toe into the content that's in there. And I encourage you to also learn about your own watershed. I know that we've got um, some local watershed experts on the line here. I have a tutorial on web-based tools that you can use to learn about your watershed. Um, that's a, a YouTube uh, an, another Zoom presentation that I gave, but it, the link is on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to find your local group. I think many of you are working with the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance, um, but if you're from outside the watershed, you can go to our website, hudsonwatershed.org slash watershed groups. And we've got an alphabetical list of all the groups that we partner with, and we've included some of their their websites, their main plans to make sure that sort of a one stop shop that you can get information you need on your local group on your local watershed. There's also opportunities to identify to partner with watershed groups on shared goals. Are there opportunities to build out networks, identify collaborations, share expertise. Um, this is a picture from the Batten kill. Um, and I think you know, again, Lorraine, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, this was a project with the Battenkill Conservancy and the municipality to make sure that there were access points along the Battenkill in the Upper Hudson, a, a really nice partnership um, to, again, showcase our rivers and streams as recreational assets, which they absolutely are. So we encourage you to stay in touch with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. You can sign up for our monthly email newsletter. I'll drop a link to that in the chat. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Hudson River Watershed Alliance. We have a YouTube channel where we post uh, recordings of many our, of our events. We have, again, that monthly breakfast lecture series. We did a, a program on stream buffer protection in the fall and lots of other content on there. And I want to thank you very much for coming and uh, for having interest in watersheds and, and being here tonight. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and drop some of those links into the chat. So you have those. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to entertain those. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, Emily, I'll take the first question, if you don't mind. Um, earlier on, you had uh, the title portion uh, with, with the map, um, and it wasn't just the the Rondo, which I'm familiar with. It went kind of spread out into maybe the Asopus and the Black Creek. Does that mean the Black Creek also in the inland areas are also um, tidal, that there, those rivers are flowing both directions? Let me go to that map and pull that up for you. Let's see. Okay, so so here's here's the map, and this is the Rondout Creek. There's the the dam at Eddyville, right? And I think that the Black Creek is further south, but there are some tributaries here that are bringing water from the town of Asopus north. Um, so the Black Creek is tidal to a certain extent, but it is further south than what's on this map. And, you know, similarly, like on this side, there's the Twelfth's Kill that comes up, up and around here. And there's a portion of the Tannery Brook here that's included. Um, and so th it's not, I, I, I don't think it includes the Black Creek, um, but it, there are some other tributaries in this area. 
So by saying that it's tidal meaning, means that uh, when the tide goes up, it's flowing one direction, and when it's going down, it flows another direction. Yeah, that's right. So up until the dam at Eddyville, the Rondout Creek is tidal. So just like the Hudson, you know, the, the uh, tide will rise and it'll lower um, twice a day. And it, it is the, the dam or, or the waterfall that was there previously that prevents it from going further upstream. And then the tributaries to this area that are through this area, those are not necessarily tidal, perhaps at the mouth. Um, but they're included in the tidal Rondout watershed because they're looking at the water that specifically flows into this little stretch. And one of the reasons that this watershed plan was done was that there was another watershed plan that was done for the section of the watershed below downstream of the Rondout Reservoir and up till the Eddyville Dam. And so this was filling in that piece of the watershed with its own watershed plan. Did somebody, uh, did, did um, Riverkeeper or somebody take out that dam in Eddyville? No, it's still there. Still there. They're planning on it? It's listed as a potential project, um, but there's no, uh, nothing's really started in earnest on that, on that site. Um, and what about, um, um, invasives. Are you guys doing anything about invasives in the Hudson River? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I personally know very little about invasive species, but it's an issue that many of our watershed group partners are, are working, working with, uh, fighting. Um, you know, obviously the Hudson River proper has a number of invasive species like water chestnut and so on. Um, many of the tributaries, the freshwater areas also have invasive species. Um, one of the things that I'll be working on probably this spring is bringing in an expert, uh, someone probably from the PRISM, PRISM program. Uh, they work on invasive species issues throughout New York State to talk to groups about what they can do. I know that in the Spark Hill Creek, they've done massive poles of invasive species and the Esopus Creek, they've had a harvester come in. This is really a challenge. And so I think that's a good example of the kind of thing that um, if these groups can share their strategies and talk about what's working and not working, um, then we can all learn together. Questions? Um, let's see, I'll ask one. Um, how many um, municipalities are getting their drinking water from the Hudson? There are, great question. Uh, there are seven municipalities that get their drinking water from the Hudson River uh, estuary. There might be more further upstream, but um, in terms of the estuary portion, uh, it's a group called the Hudson River Drinking Water Intermunicipal Council. So that's the city of Poughkeepsie, town of Poughkeepsie, town of Hyde Park, uh, town of Rhinebeck, village of Rhinebeck, town of Lloyd, town of Esopus. Um, and so they all pull drinking water from the Hudson River and they've worked together now to form this intermunicipal council and they're working on identifying potential threats to their drinking water, um, working with the water treatment plant operators to understand issues. And uh, they're included in our work on watersheds report. Uh, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance will actually be doing a community resilience building workshop for municipalities in the Hudson Seven this year, um, because having that dr the drinking water supplies right along the Hudson means that they have infrastructure that's also really potentially vulnerable to flooding, sea level rise, storm surge. So we're, we're gonna be working with them on some of those issues. Do you think um, the Hudson River um, is uh, generally clean? Do they have to treat it that much? Clean they water? do have to treat it. Um, they the the intakes tend to be deep in areas that um, are perhaps less prone to um, bacteria or some of the other problems. You know, the Hudson is pretty pretty safe to swim in a lot of the time, though not all the time. So, in terms of a drinking water source, um, you know, it it tends to be tends to be a good drinking water source. They, they do treat it, but there's also lots of issues that they're concerned about as well. Things like an oil spill, um, you know, the PCBs aren't really a problem because of the sediment is filtered out, but there's other emerging contaminants that could be a concern. Do you think um, the watershed is getting healthier as we go on? The whole Hudson River watershed? Well, I mean, it's hard to say the whole thing, but um, are, are there any areas 
that are getting healthier or worse as time goes on? Like, I don't know. You know, it's so complicated because I think one of the, one of the things that's really helped is that there are a lot of new standards for green infrastructure for stormwater management of new development. So in a lot of places, there's a much better management of runoff than there was previously, though certainly it's it also the, the rules also leave um, some things to be desired. But you know, so in general, we're not seeing some of the large scale impacts that development may have had in the past, but at the same time, a lot of those impacts are already in existence. So, you know, doing these tree plantings really helps and somewhere else there might be a new parking lot, right? So it's sort of like, there's so many pieces to this that it's hard to say overall. Um, but I think that there's a, a lot of opportunities to get more water quality information to have a better sense of, of how all of these different projects within a watershed might add up to, to in-stream help. Can I do a question just off, off the speaker? Sure. Um, so it's Duet, hi. Um, are there communities, are there streams, tributaries to the Hudson where they've actively gone after stocking or restocking the stream with something something good like brook trout um, or even bass or, or whatever, just for fishing purposes and not with the idea that DEC seems to have of doing it as an annual bonus to uh, recreation, but to get them firmly established there so they'd be in on their own uh, a pretty well developed fishery. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know a lot about fish. I'm going to be very honest with you on that one. Um, but I know that, um, like in the Asopus Creek, for example, the fish that had been stocked there did develop into uh, their own native population. Um, right. And so they've been working with DEC on a revised management plan to take that into consideration so that there isn't a need for stocking. I don't know of, of particular groups that are doing the stocking in places. Um, you know, Trout Unlimited might be a good place to ask. Um, I'll be speaking with Trout Unlimited in a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, it, would, so, it would be great if you do that. I did contact them. I tried to contact them and I was I didn't get much of a response. I explained that I was on the rondout and I was interested in seeing if we could do something here because it, 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 it looks like it could be a, a really nice fishery and, and have all sorts of uh, recreational uh, uh, benefits. But um, but I didn't get much help, and I and I don't. I'm not a fisherman. I'm 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 not. But I, I I like the idea a lot, and I'd put some time into it if there was a plan that made sense. There used to be a guy that you worked with over at DEC in New Paltz, um, who was a a fisherman himself and and interested in it. Therefore, I think, but I can't remember his name. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll ask the the my contact at Trial Unlimited and see what I can come up with. Great. Thanks. All right, I'll take another one. Um, what causes the algal bloom? Great, yes, okay. I know much more about algal blooms than fish. So we're, we're going back into my, <laughs> something I feel very confident about. Um, so algal blooms are caused by a couple different factors. So high temperature, sunlight, and nutrients. And algae is a normal part of a stream ecosystem, right? Um, the uh, algae is always present, but it becomes a problem when it reproduces so quickly, it becomes a bloom and it turns the water, you know, really colored. Some algal blooms are not as green as the picture that I showed, um, but they are a certain color. So a harmful algal bloom is a particular type that produces toxins. And so there's, it's hard to tell. There's actually no way to know even if you know, the, the type of bloom that's happening is a bloom that can produce toxins if it is actually producing toxins at that time. So DEC recommends that if you see water that's discolored, that's kind of a bright pea soup or, or a green color, if it looks like um, grass clippings, you know, to make sure you avoid contact, to make sure pets, and livestock, and kids avoid contact in particular, um, those toxins can be really harmful. Um, to human and animal health. Um, so 
in in terms of you know the factors that result that create the harmful algal bloom, we tend to see those more in lakes, in ponds, because the water is more slow moving. It has more access to sunlight, um, and often the nutrients that are coming in create this con these conditions that that al algae really like. Um, it's unusual to have a bloom in flowing water, but it's certainly possible. And you know we did see it. Um, really, a, a, a really intense and, and harmful, harmful algal bloom in the Wallkill River. Um, they've also been found in the Wappinger Creek. So it's something to, to certainly keep an eye out for. And if you do see something, the DEC has a reporting form that you can upload a photo and share information on where you where you saw it, and they'll be able to. Um, tell if it looks suspicious, if you need to follow up and, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I think with climate change, you know, there's certainly a risk that we'll have warmer temperatures. Um, and so that even the, with the current levels of nutrients that we have in some of our streams, we might end up seeing more harmful algal blooms than we have in the past. So it's really something to keep an eye out for. If, um... We have to say, um, you know, they talk about the canary in the coal mine. Um, it, would you, is there any kind of um, amphibian or kind of an animal species or even aquatic, you know, however microscopic that could be a canary in a, you know, to, to uh, kind of gauge the quantity of those to see how healthy a certain body of water or a wetland is? Yeah, so um, for streams, uh, very often the, the method that they use is looking at the types of insects that live in streams. So many insects have their first part of their life cycle is actually in flowing water uh, before they emerge and become, you know, the mayflies and the caddisflies that, that we think of as, as insects. So uh, through we can sample the bottom of the stream and look at the, the they call it benthic macroinvertebrates. So it's benthic, it's the animals that dwell on the bottom. Macro, you can see it with the naked eye and invertebrates lack a backbone, right? So they have exoskeletons, they're insects mostly. So we can look at the communities of these critters that are living in streams underneath the rocks in the riffles and look at if they are types of aquatic insects that are really tolerant of pollution or if they're really sensitive species. So like mayflies, for example, tend to be one of the more sensitive species. So if you find those in the stream, then you have a pretty healthy stream. There's other uh, midges and leeches that are much more tolerant of pollution. So you'll find them anywhere, right? And so they have these different categories to look at the aquatic life that's in those streams and come up with different categories. You know, if you found all of this biodiversity and all of these different sensitive species, then you know you have a pretty health, you have a, a very healthy system. And then there's sort of a gray area as you get down to the much more impacted system. And this is a really great tool because it shows sort of the overall integrated water quality. It doesn't necessarily say this particular stream has an issue with nutrients or this particular stream had an oil spill right it, it shows you that it's either overall really good or you know somewhere in the middle or it's been really impacted and so that's a good uh, you know dec uses this as their primary tool to look at stream health across new york state there's also a volunteer community science program called wave where you can be trained and you can go out, they give you a net and you can look for these critters and, and submit that information back to DEC. Um, and that's that's a really great way to, um, to understand, to look for that, that canary in the coal mine is sort of like a whole suite of aquatic insects um, that give us a really great picture of overall stream health. And I think if you find that, you know, you, you are in the more impacted range and you look for more information. Okay, are we going to do look at nutrients? Are we going to look at sediment? You know, what's causing them to not uh, be doing so well? But it, it's a really helpful tool to get sort of the most uh, integrated sort of broad scale look at, at water quality and stream health. All right, interesting. 
And that picture uh, that Laura mentioned uh, that corrected me, that was a Rondell Creek Watershed Alliance um, event was to do that wave training, to get folks trained on how to do those methods and take those samples in the Rondell Creek. All right, well, thanks a lot. Um, really appreciate you showing up here and doing this for us. Um, any other questions? Um, just wrap it up uh, next month. Um, on the third Thursday is uh, the Hudson Valley Farm Hub. Um, you know, they're, they're the, um, the, the farming areas. They, they took over a couple of different farms. They're on, on uh, Route 209 in Burley as you go into Kingston. Um, I've always wondered what, it, what have they done? You know, why did they buy all these farms and, and who was it that bought them and, and uh, what are they doing? Well, they're, they've been doing um, some um, some great experimenting to blend uh, ecology and biology and conservation with uh, traditional farming methods to because um, farming is inherently uh, kind of damaging to the environment so they've been combining all these different methods with pollinators and everything to make farming better and to make the environment better too um, so they're going to show a film um, in a month from now um, about the successes that they've had. And it's gonna be very interesting, so check it out. Uh, in March, we're gonna have a, um, Mark and I forget the other guy's name, he's gonna talk about birds, uh, local birds, and I'll have a lot of that going on in April. And um, what else here? Um, a, oh no, that was in March. In April, um, we're developing a new park, uh, Woodland Park in Kerhoxon that we're gonna talk about. Um, so that's uh, it's going to be a fun one to talk to. So um, that's it. Um, thank you for joining everybody. Um, who won? Who won the uh, uh, tote bag? Oh, that was Lori. She's gone, but uh, she'll contact me, and I'll get that to her. And um, if you uh, if you want to get involved, um, send us an email. We'll we'll sign you up for the uh, for the list. And if you want to join the ECC. Um, then um, let us know and um, we'll talk to you about that. And uh, we can always use members. All right. Thanks, uh, Emily.